please welcome the President and CEO of Tourism Toronto, Scott Beck, and the CEO of Business Events Sydney, Lynn Lewis-Smith, in conversation with Event MB Editor-in-Chief, Miguel Neves. Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Event MB, a Skift brand and the leading event industry resource for event technology design and innovation. I'm really excited to lead this session with the leaders of two of the most innovative destination marketing organizations in the world who also brilliantly represent their cities. Thank you for being with us today, Lynn and Scott. It's a pleasure to be having this opportunity to speak with you. Great to be um, here. Thank you. I wanted to start quickly by just acknowledging, you know, we're still in the pandemic and I wanted to just get a very brief update of where you are, where your destinations are on the ground right now just quickly to, to kind of set the scene. Lynn, I'll, I'll start with you if you don't mind. Okay, thanks, Miguel. Um, yeah, it's a bit of the tale of two cities at the moment uh, with Scott and I sitting here. You know, six weeks ago, Australia had a free economy and we were moving around brilliantly. And uh, today I'm in a hard lockdown here in Sydney. Um, half of our population in Australia is in lockdown. Um, and that's because the Delta strain has hit and we have low vaccination rates. Unfortunately, we only have 28% um, that have had their first shot and 11% fully vaccinated. So we have a long way to go. Uh, yeah, that's where we're sitting right now. Okay, how about you, Scott? What's the story with you? It's, it's I don't wanna, um... I don't want to sound like I, uh, um, I'm, 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 I'm uh, feeling lucky. Let's just put it that way. It is a tale of two cities. Six weeks ago, we were in a hard lockdown. You still couldn't dine in restaurants. You know, retail for the for, for the most part was closed. Um, but due to an extremely aggressive um, and very successful vaccination program, um, and a very clear path from the government where they laid out benchmarks and said this is the this is where we have to be. Uh, we're now coming out of lockdown. So as of last week, restaurants are open, both indoor dining, um, patios are open, retails open at like fifty percent. Um, we're, we're moving about um, still cautiously with with a, a really strong mask mandate mandate and a commitment to, to masks by businesses. Um, but with nearly 60% of our province fully vaccinated and 78% first vax, um, I think we're really feeling good about uh, the management of it. Now, that said, uh, a lot of caution with the variant and, and masks are still a very, very prominent part of, of how our community is addressing it. Thank you for that. And I don't want to dwell on that too much, but I think it's important for the audience to understand where we are at the moment. So I know that this has also given us a kind of a strange opportunity to really understand what the kind of lack of tourism and in particular the lack of business events, what that means to the local community. And I know that Scott, you had some, some examples. I just wondered if you could touch on that a little bit, how this lack of business events has sort of showcased how important business events are. And also, you know, when looking forward to, to reopening and fully reopening and hopefully in-person events happening all the time, how do you balance that, you know, the need for direct spend, the need for heads on beds with what you'd like to look at, which is kind of the, the bigger picture? And I'll start with you, Scott, but I also wanted to get Lynn's take on that. Well, I think foremost, the, you know, the, the absence of the visitor um, has has been noticed. Um, I think in, in large measure in urban destinations, tourism is 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 not necessarily well recognized. Tourism can be viewed as leisure travel. Um, and so when you have something like this pandemic and it, it really shows the full scope of the visitor, the, the impact is just as it is from an economic study, you have direct induced and then you have indirect. And, and those induced and indirect spends become very, very um, uh, apparent when you have no visitation. Um, and so in a city like Toronto, where business events are such a strategic part of our of our economic sort of ethos, it's a part of our economic community. Um, and so what we what we realized early on were things that were, you know, not just anecdotal, but shuttle taxi water taxis over to Toronto Island. Um, I had the opportunity to just, just talk to one casually. And he was like, yeah, we really missed the fact that the convention center is closed. And I don't think a year ago he would have recognized the impact of having no convention delegates um, or it would have just been perceived those are all leisure travelers, but they really recognized because of 
no badges, that just the simple indication that we're with a convention because of the badge, all of that's been been, been very apparent. Um, and so that whole ecosystem that ex exists around the convention centers is not just heads and beds, that is, you know, the restaurants, the linen suppliers, the the all of the farmers that bring in the organic food that's serving the convention center. And that whole ecosystem has, has been impacted. And I think what it's done in, in large measure is what we had hoped to accomplish with our groundbreaking study we did on the visitor economy and something that we have emulated what Lynn and her team has been doing with this beyond tourism concept is really talking about the full impact as it relates to our, our economic sort of the ecosystem. And so knowing that in large measure, the, the first experience someone has that's gonna be um, a workforce Canada in the future, FDI, all of those things in large measure are a genesis of travel. Someone coming to your destination for a business trip to attend a convention. And that has been, we have leaned into that. We have we have really taken a chance to, to, to showcase that that impact is not in our community anymore. Sure. And Lynn, I mean, in Sydney, have you felt the same thing? I mean, unfortunately, at the moment, it might be slightly differently, but tell us a little bit about how you felt it. Yeah, I mean, all, all the what Scott said is true in terms of uh, the immediate delegate impact. Um, I think what else we, we have seen is now in our hospitality industry, a lot of people are leaving um, because of job security and, and we don't have immigration, so we don't have um, people here and students here that are working in a hospitality. And so our labour force is really struggling and, and we're going to start seeing that the supply chain um, is going to start struggling because of the lack of um, tourists and visitors and business events. I think what is invisible or intangible are the other benefits that... Um, you know, Scott mentioned our Beyond Tourism Benefits work. You know, we've been working with the University of Technology Sydney um, Business School for 10 years now to look at the long tail benefits of hosting global meetings in Sydney. And it's those intangible benefits that have now come to the fore um, and governments sitting up as they're looking at their recovery strategies and when we reopen borders as to what's been missing. And we haven't been able to showcase our... Um, our you know innovation experiences around particular industry sectors uh, sector development there is no trade or physical trade happening on the exhibition floor therefore you don't have your smes and businesses being exposed to a global audience um, the knowledge economy is impacted there's on flow benefits into our knowledge economy into the delegates learning taking back tools and techniques to their workforce that you know, leads to innovation um, and productivity. And the other thing's talent. And I, I, I've been um, pretty passionate about um, our, our um, aggressive strategy to attract talent. A talent is going to be wanted by every city in the world right now. And we know the capital follows talent. Um, from the research that we did of a thousand delegates over five industries, um, international delegates that had visited Sydney for a conference, 41% said they wanted to come and live and work or study in Sydney and 7% had applied. And I think that just shows you the power of hosting global meetings. And what's missing now is we're not attracting that talent because we're not exposing exposing um, Sydney's livability and business opportunities. So um, there's a foreign direct investment, uh, as Scott mentioned as well, you can't showcase your soft and hard infrastructure to gain that investment. And so the virtual hybrid model is great, but you need broadcasting rights to be able to showcase that in a virtual environment. So the world, yeah, has changed in terms of hosting business events online versus face-to-face. -face. There are many things that we're missing out on right now and it's being recognized. Really interesting. I wonder if you could touch a little bit on, on your strategy for attracting business events, because obviously, you know, things, are difficult at the moment, but you're still working on this. And I know that you both have specific industries that you uh, that you look for, that you that you've researched, and you try to connect with your local communities. And I wonder if I could go back to Scott. Can you tell us tell us a little bit about how that works, and, and which cities in particular you look at, and, and what's that strategy to bring people in? 
Yeah, I mean, I think all of us owe a, 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 a big debt of gratitude to Lynn and as one of the pioneers behind this. And I think I would best define our strategy as one where instead of us going out and saying, what sector of the technology industry are we going to pursue? We go to our community and say, what's, what's, what's working here? Where are we seeing innovation? Where are areas within our own community where advances and research is being done in the tech sector? So let's take AI, for example. A lot of people might not know, but Toronto is the epicenter of AI right now in the world. And so we then align with what's happening in our in our community sort of organically. And we say, OK, we know that there are several business events, um, key conferences, if you will, in that space that we then go and work collaboratively with these thought leaders in our community because they're all parts of professional societies and professional associations. And they want to advocate not only on behalf of their industry, but their community. I mean, they're in Toronto for for a reason, and so it's this you know this coming together again of a really cool s system that allows us to leverage and lean into what our community is already doing, take leaders from that community, and help us uh, go out and win business and target business that reflects that community. Um, and and I think again, it's a strategy that we look to Sydney to do. I think um, there's a there's other cities in the US, I think Destination DC does it really well. Um, and and I, I, I believe it's one of those areas where we as, as destination sales and marketing professionals um, can really lean into what, what, is, what is in our community. And that's been sort of the most, um, the biggest opportunity, but also the most rewarding. Hmm. Lynn, would you like to add anything to that? And I think just to be clear, I mean, this kind of strategy is across associations, but also the corporate strategy. Is that different yeah. or does that cover both of them? From our perspective, it, it covers both. It, it really it really depends on where the conventions live and where the meetings live. There are some events that live within sort of the business event corporate ecosystem, and some that live within the association world. and And they're they're very different in the way that they uh, interact with your community. Um, but this pathway of, of finding them, I think, is 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 very similar. Yeah. And and Lynn, in your case in Sydney, you you take a similar approach. You also go to the communities first and understand what what they're looking for. Yeah, it's it's um. It's interesting because this is the second crisis we've had in a few years. And I say the first crisis was not um, as serious. We didn't have a convention center for three years. So we had to really reimagine uh, re what the world would be, you know, in that three years without the convention center and then building back better, if you like, or building back best. We um, specifically align to the economic development framework of our state government and the economic blueprint. And what's been really interesting is the infrastructure investment around Sydney. We have in the metropolis of three cities. So we have our downtown area, which is now our tech and innovation precinct that we're developing. There's a central city, um, which is the geographic heart of Sydney, and that's a health precinct. And we're attracting medical technology um, as well as health services. And now we're building a third city in greater Western Sydney, and we're building a second international airport, and we're building a smart city from the ground up. So for us, it's looking around the world for the events that are about building cities. So whether that's um, urban design architecture, waterway, smart cities, um, intelligent transport networks. And our research is purely focused on where can we bring in the world leaders that can discuss and debate what we're doing and, and give us the opportunity to showcase to a global audience, but collaborate on getting the best outcome. And I think um, that for us, you know, leans back into that beyond tourism benefits. It's not just the delegates expenditure, but look at all the outcomes um, from foreign direct investment, trade and global talent um, that we can expend from that strategy in particular. So very much aligned with government, but as to Scott's point, it's bringing together industry, the not-for-profit sector, academia and government all have to be at the table because everyone benefits as well as the event owner and the delegates from the experience. What a great case study. I mean, you, you can kind of get the best of all different worlds in, in bringing it together to really develop uh, what you're developing. That's great. I, you touched on convention centers, and I wanted to, to bring up a point about sustainability and perhaps convention centers, but anything that you can um, share with us around sustainability. I mean, we've seen big companies like BlackRock and Microsoft all come out with statements around sustainability. And I recently also spoke to um, 
someone doing research in this area is telling me that associations are actively looking for destinations that take sustainability very seriously. And the leaders within associations are saying, this is what our members are looking for. How do you, how do you work with planners when it comes to that sustainability side? And I'd like to go back to Scott maybe first for that. Um, thanks. I think um, one of the things I, I wanted to just echo one thing that Lynn said as well as I sort of make this transition to sustainability that our industry's alignment with government, the business events industry alignment with government is so key to the future. They have investments in so many aspects of that community that make it such a relevant partner. And we always we haven't always been there. Um, and I think you just have brought up one that is also enormously important that is sustainability. Um, I know that the, the the community that I live in takes it takes it very seriously, the impact that they're making on the world. And I think counterintuitively, I think urban destinations actually are can be real leaders in sustainability. Um, there are things that urban destinations can do so well in terms of mass transportation and, and the way that they design and build the buildings that are part of it and the mandates that they create at the city level, at the provincial or state level, and then at the federal level can be very, very impactful to that. And I think, you know, coming out of the pandemic, the sustainability has morphed a little bit to also include this idea of well-being, um, you know, your, your personal well-being and how that is such an important element of it. And I think, again, it gets it comes back to one of those um, tried and true, you know, thought processes. And that is that it's it's got to be reflective in the community. We, we can only advocate for sustainability as far as our communities will go. And I think that's one of the areas where as as we look at the, the the work and the development we do within the destinations on behalf of the visitors, really bringing that forward to talk about why that is so impactful. And at convention centers, it is it there is critical mass. There there's enough people there that changes with diversion, with reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, those things can make a really really big impact to our communities, our local communities. Um, and then as we get to talk about the opportunity we have as an industry to talk about our carbon footprint and other elements we do. Those buildings can have can play a very very important role in the reduction of carbon in our communities, and I think that's where we see a real opportunity, but also um, a real responsibility to take this uh, and advocate for it within our communities, but then also lean into it and let the communities know how important it is for our industry, alongside how important our industry is for our communities. And again, that symbiotic connection can make this a a real deliverable that has benefits for the economy, for the residents, for the attendees, um, in a way that, that is, is, is going to be impactful. Lynn, would you yeah. add anything to that from your perspective? Uh, look, I would totally agree with what Scott's saying. I think um, most cities uh, with their local councils and government and industry is looking at the SDGs. And I think that we, um, when we're acquiring or procuring global events should be working with the event owners on those SDGs to, if we, um, a joint objective on what, what could we put in the value proposition to extract when the event's here to give back to the community. I think that's really um, critical and we can play a part there. It's interesting in Australia, we're moving from fossil fuels to renewable resilience is a big topic in this country um, as we transition. Um, and I'm not sure if you've heard of SDGs, so the Environment, Social and Governance, and, and it's very much a topic at boards, at board level um, of every organisation in Australia at this point in time. So whether it's a convention centre board or my board or um, any industry, this topic is front and centre for Australia and, and for many around the world, as Scott's pointed out. So, yeah, we're all working towards a better world, <laughs> that's for sure. For sure. So, unfortunately, we have to wrap up very soon. So, I wanted to just get your views on, on a sort of macro view for, for economic growth. You know, are we going to see economic growth and what? How are we gonna How are we gonna get there in your view? And and I'd start with Lynn in this case, but just in in a quick a quick uh, minute or so. Wow, a macro, um, and and in context of the visitor economy. Yeah, I mean, essentially yeah. the the future of, of of business events. How are we gonna How are we gonna get to where we want to be? Uh, I think we've got a wee way to go. <laughs> we need international yeah. borders to open up first and foremost. Um, I think it's about destinations and DMOs leading the visitor economy stakeholders to come together, together 
on re-entry strategies and really have a well-planned strategic approach to how we re-enter the market. And um, it won't be volume, it'll be um, more quality over quantity, I think. Uh, and that will get better outcomes leading into that beyond tourism benefits if we can change the narrative and the view from direct expenditure alone and get that dual benefit, I think that we'll have significant growth in the in the future. Absolutely. And you speak to the importance of really measuring that that impact and, and, yeah. and being able to, to tell that story. Scott? Well, I'm very I'm very optimistic about the future. I, I'm I am committed that it is better managed that we are more focused and diligent with how we grow. So it's not growth at just, just for growth's sake, it's growth, it's, it's focused and intentional growth. Um, I'm also very optimistic that business events will be viewed um, as, as part of our economic structure in our communities, not just as tourism. I, I hope at some point we get away from the word tourism and it just becomes part of the economy. Um, and we really look to the visitor to be that key indicator because Business travel is just as impactful as leisure travel. And too often tourism is synonymous with leisure travel. So I really hope that the day comes when business events are just a part and parcel of the economic structure of, of all of our communities. Excellent, a great message to end on. Thank you so much for joining us, Lynn Lewis-Smith and Scott Beck. It's been a pleasure to spend these moments with you. Thank you very much. Our pleasure, thank, thank you. Thank you, bye.